flight attendant. Uh, she spent a, a week's vacation in the Rockies. Sounds like a nice idea, doesn't it? And she was, as understandably, captivated by the mountain peaks and clear blue skies and sweet-smelling pines, but she also was charmed by a very eligible bachelor who owned and operated a cow ranch and also lived in a log cabin. And at the end of this week, Mr. Wonderful proposed. But it had all happened so fast so quickly that the woman decided that she should return home and return to her job, feeling that she would somehow be guided to make the right decision in this matter. Next day in flight, she found herself wondering, what do I do? To perk up, she decided she would go in the restroom and splash some water on her face, and suddenly there was a little bit of turbulence in the plane, and then there's a sign inside the restroom that lit up and says, please return to the cabin. She did. To the cabin back in the mountains. Now this story, as romantic as it might sound, for us as believers, does not, does not demonstrate the best way to make decisions in life. Let me repeat that. It does not demonstrate the best way to make important decisions, lifelong decisions in our life. But the story does reveal to us this morning a very common dilemma that many people, including Messianics, often face. The dilemma I'm referring to is the problem of being sure that God is guiding and ordering our steps. In other words, how can you and I be certain that we are in God's will and that the decisions we are making are the right ones. This is an important subject for us, for all of us, since we all must make important decisions, sometimes on a daily basis. We all must take various courses of action, and we desire assurance that it's God that is directing our paths. How can we be sure? How can we as believers be sure of that divine guidance and that divine direction? Where well, our portion this morning, from this morning's parasha, Chaye Sarah, which translated means the life of Sarah, is unique in that this prayer by Eliezer, Avraham's servant, is the first instance in Scripture of someone calling upon God for guidance. The first instance. God, brothers and sisters, what sets him apart from the worldly concept of God is that he is approachable. For so many centuries, God has been depicted as ethereal, out there somewhere. And much too holy to have audience with us. So he keeps a, a safe distance as if we all have some incurable disease, which we, we thought was incurable, but is very curable. That disease is sin. But by the blood of Tomah and Yeshua, it is curable. But while we're unclean, he likes to keep a distance from us. But God is far too holy to want any audience with us. At least that was the thought for centuries. But now we know that God is very, very approachable. In fact, he's as near as our prayer. The moment you say that prayer, the Father draws near. There are individuals, I'm going to embarrass him, Bob, who spends a great deal of time in prayer. And he understands the significance that for every decision he makes, even from the most mundane, this choice of whether 
Well, one I'm going to have to eat for lunch or something, you know, or just the daily choices that we make on a regular basis. You're making choices right now whether you're going to sit and listen to me or you're going to check out and go somewhere else, you know, mentally. You're deciding right now. You're deciding whether this, this sermon or message is relevant to you. You're making all kinds of decisions right now. And Bob sets aside time, as I know many of you do, to come into the presence of God, to set aside a, a time and place to be alone with the Lord, to be sure that the choices and decisions that, you make, that he makes throughout the day will, to the best of his ability, be led and guided by God's Spirit. Father, like our Father God, is close. He looks after us. He looks after his children. And he's there to offer us advice, to offer us guidance. I always make myself available to my sons, but I don't impose myself upon them. Certainly at times I'll direct and order their steps and shut doors and open doors as God does to us. But there's certain things they want to learn. They want certain advice, direction. I'm always there. I drop everything for them. That's what God does for you. God the Father will leave that for you. But you got to knock at his door. Or you got to say, hey, Lord, I have a question for you. Dad, right? And most of you that are fathers have been in that situation where your sons have come up to you, your daughters have come up to you and said, I, I, I don't know what to do here. What, what, what would you suggest? Of course, that doesn't happen until you're about 25, until they're about 25 or 30. Because at that point, you're an idiot. You don't know anything. You know. They all know better. Now in this parashah, we not only see God providing guidance to his people in an important manner, but we also see the conditions under which this guidance was provided. These conditions, which could also be referred to as principles, are important for us to discuss today. And this is one of the standard messages. Three-part sermon. Well, I'm going to bust it wide open. I'm going to go four parts. So hold on. This is a four-parter. So they teach it in hermeneutics in seminary. A three-part sermon. Well, I'm teaching you a four-parter today. I've always been the rebel. <laughs> Is that going into the book? Don't, don't, no, don't. No, keep that out of the book. <laughs> keep that out of the book. The four key principles I'm going to share with you this morning. And I think you know them, but I think it's important to hear them and, and hear them and then be reminded and apply them in your choices and decision making. Four key principles that will lead to God's providential guidance as witnessed in our portion today. You know, Chai Sarah is actually a very short portion. Very short portion. But, how do I say, uh, buried, if not buried, it's like, it's like, it's not really hidden, but therein lies great wisdom on how to make a decision. And so if we follow these principles, I believe that we can expect the same success, the same success that the Yitzhak and Eliezer experienced, and Abraham experienced in receiving God's providential guidance. So the first principle, and if you want to write these down, you can, but the first principle of receiving God's guidance is pretty obvious. It's a no-brainer. We need to know God's word. Now, I'm not saying that you had to be a, you know, that you can quote chapter and verse from the beginning of the book to the end of the book, but, look, I know my wife, but it's an ongoing process to continue to know her. Each of you that have been in relationships, I mean, you might have children. You think you know your children, but over time, they evolve as individuals, and you get to know them as they evolve. It's, it's a progressive revelation. You know them, but you continue to know them, right? You have Yeshua in your life, but there's a continued revelation of him in your life. It doesn't just, okay, I confess Yeshua as Lord and Master, and I know him. No. It's an ongoing relationship of deepening our, our understanding and knowing of that individual. It doesn't just stop right at confession of faith. 
And so we need to know God's word. We must have a thorough knowledge of God's will and purposes to help direct our actions and direct our decisions. The knowledge of God's will comes first and foremost, where? From his word. God's word reveals God's plans, God's purposes, God's principles. And knowledge of these is essential to even beginning, even beginning to receive God's guidance. It is Abraham's knowledge of God's will revealed to him that leads Abraham to make the first step in the right direction of receiving God's guidance. Now what Abraham knows is that God has promised what? You know the scripture. What was the promise that Abraham received? Abraham was spoken to directly by God and God said, or God promised that he would bless him. He would bless him. How? He would increase Abraham's descendants to as many as there are stars in the sky or grains of sand on the, she on the seashore. A direct promise, revelation from God. Now with the death of his wife Sarah, Abraham recognizes that he must take some steps to be sure that God's plan is furthered through his son Yitzhak. I'm not talking about creating an Ishmael here. I'm not talking about taking matters into your own hands and superseding God and how we do things. Okay? Abraham understands that he's not to sit idly by and wait for God's plan to be fulfilled. That he plays a role in the process. All of you play a role in God's will and purpose for your life. And so, Abraham does take his part and he takes appropriate action. And in this case, he begins to look for a wife for Yitzhak. For his son Isaac. And some people think that receiving God's guidance really does mean doing nothing. For instance, I've known people who are out of work, out of work, and yet refuse to go looking for a job because they are waiting for God to provide them a job. God is in control, they'll say. So I don't need to go looking or do anything. I'll just wait for the phone to ring. Brothers and sisters, as absurd as that sounds, that mentality not only exists, but it is taught in the pulpit. It is absurd, but it is a reality of the condition of the body of Messiah today that such distortion of God's word is taught. It's unbiblical. God requires us to do our part. We are in a partnership. We're in a relationship with God. We work together for his perfect will. So we do our part, and we do it guided by the knowledge of God's word. And that's exactly what Abraham did. His search for a wife isn't based on human standards or desires, but it's rather directed by his knowledge of God's will as we Revealed by God, spoken word. Yes, I said spoken word, because I know that the Torah doesn't exist yet in a written form. This is why he insists that Yitzhak's wife be from his own relatives and not from the local people of Canaan or Canaan. And why does Abraham insist upon this condition? Because he knew enough of God from what he had spoken to him to know that God would not bless a union or a covenant with a Kenai woman. Because that particular people group represented those who lived apart from God and not living with God. They would not be equally yoked. And we see this a lot in marriages where one or the other they didn't know the Lord when they came into the relationship or they had it some time in their life and they're not walking with the Lord. And suddenly there is an awakening in one of the spouses, but the other spouse has not come to that place of awakening. 
And the question is always, what do I do? What do I do? Well, you don't divorce. <laughs> because as we spoke about last week, once God joins the two, we're not to separate. So that's just that, again, you know, I, I, I get that all. There are people that actually believe, actually believe that, oh, my goodness, I married the wrong person. God didn't intend for us to be together. We better break this up and get together. Believe it. There are people that not only believe that, but preach that, which is even more disturbing and certainly more unbiblical. He wasn't going to be unequal, have his son unequally yoked with a woman that is not walking with the Lord or shares the same principles of God. If God was fine with a Kenai woman for his son Yitzhak, he would have conveniently got hooked up with his servant Eliezer's daughter. She was right there. Abraham remembered earlier on when God had revealed the character which is wicked and the future judgment of the people of Canaan to Abraham. That alone was enough for Abraham to know that marrying one of them was not an option, was not going to happen. In essence, Abraham was being guided by God's revealed word. I'm aware, as I said earlier, there was no Torah at this time, but God spoke to Abraham, and God's revealed words gave Abraham enough information to make reasonable inferences. Now, there isn't, and let me share this with you, there, in our contemporary society, no different than our Constitution, what do we see today as a, as, a, uh, as a country? We have a constitution, right? One of the arguments that exists today is that our constitution is outdated. That we need to rewrite the constitution to reflect society as it exists today. That those, those old guys, they didn't know how things would you know, evolve you know, morally, ethically, and so we need to bring that, that old document up to speed. And the same thought it exists in relation to the Bible. You wouldn't have gay pastors right now. Right? That's why you have homosexual sodomites leading congregations. How ridiculous is that? Just because from their point of view that the Bible is dated and it's not really uh, up to speed with how society has evolved. It needs to be brought in to more of a contemporary value system and mindset. There isn't in the Bible a specific command for every life situation. What? True. There is not. But remember that the scripture says God's Ruach speaks to us and guides us into all truth. For instance, there is no specific rule or command for God that tells me what to watch or not to watch TV, uh, not to watch a TV. Is there? It doesn't say, if I read the Bible, it doesn't say, don't watch that show. Well, you can watch that, don't watch that. How do I make this decision? How do I make these choices? I can still receive God's guidance and make wise decisions, decisions by applying biblical principles such as purity, righteousness, to make my choices. I can apply those principles in the choices that I make in life. Abraham was able to take these first steps in the right direction because he knew God's spoken word. And the same is true for us receiving God's direction. The first principle for receiving God's guidance is knowing God's word. The second principle for receiving God's guidance is commitment to his will. It doesn't do us any good to know God's word if we're not committed to his will in that word. Right? It's one, like I said, it's one thing to, to know God's will. It's another to be committed to it. Right? Right? to be committed to doing 
what he wants us to do without compromise. But yet we do that. We, we say we're committed to God's will, but we pick or choose what suits us. And if you need any evidence of that, where is everybody today? Huh? Why is not every, this congregation and every house of worship filled to the brim with people who are committed to his will, that this is the standard of their life? The reality being, they're not committed to this. They're committed to the institution. They're committed to the building. They're committed to the denomination. They're not committed to this. You have to wake up and believe that. Because it's true. It is true. And truth is hard to swallow, and sometimes it steps on a toe or two. But to know what God's will is, is to be committed to it. And to be committed to his will without compromise is right here, the word of God. Now one of the conditions under which Abraham received God's providential guidance was his complete commitment, his complete commitment to do God's will. And our portion reveals to us that God guides us when we are committed to his will and not our own will. No matter how difficult it sometimes seems to do God's will. Nobody said it was going to be easy, brothers and sisters. Is it easy, Mike? No. Is it easy, Beth? No. no. David, is it easy? Huh? Mike Carlton, is it easy? No. Heck no, it isn't easy. Is it easy, Rabbi? No. No, it's not. There isn't anything that says it would, would be easy. Suppose, well, suppose the woman isn't willing to follow me to this land, asked Eliezer. Guess it's not going to be easy. Must I then bring your son back to the land from which you came? What if your plan, what if God's plan doesn't work out as planned? The servant is basically asking if Abraham will change his mind and change his commitment to God's will. If it appears that doing things God's way doesn't work, Abraham kind of already learned that lesson, didn't he? He learned that lesson the hard way, creating the Ishmael. I'll try God's way. Have you said that? See if it works out. I'll try God as a last resort. I was sharing that with my kids about tithing the other day. I said, you know how people tithe? You know, they, I was telling them, I said, you know, kids, you know, only 20% of the people give 80% of what comes in. You know that. And they went, what? I'm like, what? I go, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a known fact. Only 20% of the people give 80% of the tithes and offerings. That's a known fact. Really? I said, yeah, yeah, it, 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 exactly, exactly. Do you, know how they, do you know how people tithe today? He goes, no, no, tell me, Dad. I said, well, what they do is they get their paycheck, and they say, well, I gotta pay my rent, I gotta pay my electric, I gotta pay my cell phone bill, I gotta pay my cable, I gotta pay my credit card bills, and then if there's anything left over, well, then I'll give it to God. If I'm able to. Uh, but I gotta take care of my responsibilities first. I gotta take care of my bills first. I gotta get food. So that's how they paid it. But the Bible says it's the first fruits. It's the first thing. So you, you write that check first, and then you work it out with the rest. And I've always said, and I know you probably get sick of me saying it, it's not about the 10%, it's about the 90%. It's how we manage the 90. We're managers of the master's resources. So, so it's not about giving the 10. That's just a no-brainer. It's what we do with the 90. Because if we manage the 90 well, then the 10 is easy. It's there. Everybody agree with me on that? Yes. Everybody, I'm not getting a big amen on that. I wonder why. Did I convict anybody here on that one? I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'd be lying. Sorry. sorry. Just... Turn it and I preach that word again. Yep. It says, uh, Abraham says to his servant that Yitzhak is not to leave the promised land. He 
He's not to leave, no matter what. What he's saying is, we're going to do it God's way here, no matter what. I'm doing it God's way. Avraham makes it clear that he is totally committed. He's in with both feet to following God's will, no matter what, ta what happens. And I hope you respond in your own lives with that same uncompromising commitment to obey God when you are confronted with a very, very similar situation. And we all, we're confronted with stuff every day. But the only way we can be sure of God's guidance is by being committed to God's will above our own will. Many other scriptures also attest to this principle. One of the best known is the ever familiar Proverbs 3, verse 6, read in the New Living Translation, says it this way, Seek his will in all you do, and then he, the Lord, will direct your paths. Many times, people find themselves out of God's perfect will because when it comes right down to it, they're not fully committed to his plan for their life. We just pick the parts that work for us. They may pray. You may quote the Bible. You may talk about seeking God's will. But in reality, you're not seeking God's will. You're seeking God's approval for your own plan. Not submitted to his. God will work supernaturally in your life. I promise you. God will work supernaturally in your life to bring about his plans. As he did with Yitzhak and Rivka. But only when your purpose and your commitment is to his way of doing things. His will. So we, we're talking about knowing God's word. We're talking about being committed to God's will. And so the third principle for receiving God's guidance is trusting in God's ways. His ways are not, a, not our ways, are they? No. Trust is absolutely essential if you are to be led by God because you will never maintain your commitment to obeying Him and waiting on Him, on him unless you really have faith, unless you really trust in Him. Another way of saying, like I said, trust is faith. Tozer, A.W. Tozer points out that having faith in faith is not enough. Having faith in faith is not enough. See, my question, well, often what you hear someone say is, and you hear this all the time, is they say, well, I'm a person of faith. Really? So my question back to them is, faith in what? I'm a person of faith. I pray. Great. What do you pray to? Faith in what? People don't like that kind of question. They think you're just being argumentative. <laughs> but it's a good question to ask. Sometimes my wife, she says, you're such a douche sometimes. And I'll say, I could mean that. But she says, no, you're really not. She goes, at need, she'll say it, but, yeah, right. <laughs> And, I was, and I said, do you really mean that? She goes, no. She goes, what? Sometimes you just you say the thing that nobody's going to say. And I said, that's right. That's who I am. I can't, I can't sidestep that. I'll give you a classic example. <laughs> a classic example was some, somebody on Facebook is going to go see Amy Grant. And I just made a comment saying, I still have a problem with her dumping her husband for another man. I still have a problem with that. It isn't like she came forward publicly and said, gosh, I really blew it this time. It was a mistake. I'm sorry. I apologize. Please forgive me. I repent. That was the wrong thing to do. She never did that. So why am I going to support this woman? She was a born-again, spirit-filled Christian woman who's on tour worshiping and praising the Lord, and she dumps her husband for a country rock, country star. It's not right. Why am I going to support that? Did I believe she's got beautiful music? Yes. So did Hasatan. He was the worship leader. And he got cast down. I mean, come on. Boy, I got, I got hung out to dry on that one, boy. Woo. I got unfriended for that one. I was name calling. I was just... Honestly, I wasn't really trying to pick a fight. It's just saying, as a brother in the Lord, as a doctor amongst Christians, my point of view was, I have, that's exactly what I said, I struggle with the fact that she has not sought repentance for dumping her husband. 
Our confidence should not be in the power of faith. Our confidence should be in Him who is the origin and foundation and source of faith and resting place for all of our faith, Yeshua HaMashiach. You must trust that He will provide everything necessary to fulfill His will for your life in His own way. If God says it, I know it is so. Period. And this is what Abraham did. He trusted God to providentially to provide a wife for his son from outside of Canaan, no matter how unlikely that possibility seemed. God, or God will send his angel, I'm reading scripture, God will send his angel ahead of you, and you are to bring a wife for my son from there. There's no wiggle room there. It's going to happen that way, because that's what God wills to happen. So there's no left or right. There's no gray. It's what's going to happen. And there's nothing else that can be said. If God says it, he'll do it. Period. And Avram expects God to keep his word as we should. And to lead his servant Eliezer to his son's future wife. His confidence is based on God's specific word and promise, not in some personal desire. Many people express their trust in God, but their trust is that God will provide what they want and what they desire. That's a whole different set of circumstances there. God honors trust and what he wants and what he desires. Do you trust in what God will do? Or do you trust in affirming what you want to do? That's a different scenario there. What are the trends, what are the chances that Abraham's servant can travel? Listen to this. This is what he has faith in. One of the chances that Eliezer is going to travel 500 miles, he's going to meet a qualified woman from Abraham's own family, and then convince her and her family to travel to a distant land with a total stranger, and then marry a man she and her family have never met. What do you think? It's going to work out? Would you invest in that? Would you bet on that? The Browns are going to win the Super Bowl. That's what it is. I knew I could put an illustration out there that you could, that could draw you all into. That's what an illustration does. That's what it was. <laughs> it's kind of like... Nevertheless, Abraham clearly expects God to do this, just this by sending an angel to providentially guide and provide. He's not trusting his own understanding or insight. But instead, he's trusting God. He's trusting God's ways. And this trust is essential to being directed by God. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not rely or lean upon your own understanding. You will not be directed by God unless you are committed to him and trust in him to provide his will to be fulfilled in your life. Whether the issue is a marriage, ministry, a move, or some other life issue, we must trust God supernaturally and providentially to arrange the circumstances at the right time in the right way. That's how he works. But it's important that I say this. Abraham acknowledged, as we should, that it may not happen as we expect. Really? <laughs> no, it doesn't. It never does. It never does. And this isn't a lack of trust in God. Just an acknowledgement that God may provide in a different manner than we are expecting or anticipating, because that's what we do. God wants something done, so we think, well, this is the most logical way for it to happen. And then it doesn't happen that logical way. And then we immediately go, well, wait a minute. It had to happen this way. God messed up. Oh, gone it. And then you start to lose faith in God because he didn't do things like you thought they should be done in the way that you figured them out to be done. I got a wake-up call for you guys. That's not how he does things. As soon as you got it all figured out, that's when he does it differently. I don't know, maybe he's got a sixth sense of humor. I don't know. But he always tries to do it in a way that you never would imagine. And I think he just loves to do it that way. But that's what he does. One way or another, God's going to provide His will to be done. 
without his people compromising his word. So remember, knowing his word, knowing his will, and trusting him in his ways. Finally, the fourth principle for receiving, this is the fourth part I told you, the fourth principle is receiving God's guidance is to pray for wisdom. Eliezer didn't just assume that he would recognize whom God had provided as a wife for Yitzhak. Our portion is his prayer, <coughs> excuse me, for guidance and wisdom. If you read the portion, did you notice that after a long 500-mile journey in the wilderness on a camel, nice, Eliezer arrives at the perfect place to meet a young, unmarried family member at the perfect time, the woman would be coming to the well to draw water. Did you notice that? Yes. What luck! Yeah, really. Wrong. <laughs> Wrong. What providence. Quit giving Hasatan credit. Boy, were you lucky. No. I don't give any credit to Lucifer, because that's where luck comes from. I don't give any credit to Lucifer. I give all the glory and honor and praise to God. That's his providence that he made it happen. Get that word luck out of your dictionary. Eliezer didn't assume. Nope. Got it divinely arranged circumstances perfectly for his will to be fulfilled in this situation. Avraham's knowledge, commitment, and trust were not in vain. God was working behind the scene. I am convinced, I am convinced that God will direct our circumstances so that his will is successfully fulfilled in our lives if we do our part. If we do our part of knowing his word, staying steadfast and studying the word and knowing the word, that we stay committed to his will, put our will aside, not my will, but yours be done, right? That we trust in his ways, faith, and pray for his wisdom. Seriously, take a moment. I was thinking about this when I was, you know, writing this message. I was thinking, as, as I was writing, uh, looking at people's life circumstances, if you think about, everybody here has a, has a witness, has a testimony. Everybody here does. Somewhere in your walk with the Lord, you had a situation where God worked and guided your circumstances in remarkable ways. Right? Mary Lou, what are you doing here? Why is this woman in the Presbyterian Church for, what, 70 years, 60 years? 76. 76 years she's in the Presbyterian Church. What on earth are you doing here? Enjoying listening to your messages and praising the Lord. How did it happen? How did it happen you walked in the door? Prayer. And what happened? I walked in the door. How did you know we existed? Telephone book. Oh. <laughs> Open the telephone book. God says, go to the start east. Right? Yeah. Right? Mary Lou? Right? No regrets. Same story with Tammy and Jim Stout. Same story. They're here, right? William? Where'd he go? He's sneaky. He was back there. He knew I was going to call him. <laughs> William Atkins! William really Atkins, I tell this story. He's just you know, walking out here in the plaza, we're down in the corner. And Larry Bailey, who used to come here, was standing out there. They just got to talking. He's been coming here ever since. He was looking for a place like this. Didn't even know we existed. But that was his doc. That was where he was believing. That's where he was walking with the Lord personally. But there was no place around him like this. And he just he had no idea he wasn't coming here. He didn't know this existed. Vic. I remember the first time Vic came in, we were like a week old. He walks in, he goes, I'm a born-again, spirit-filled Christian. I'll tell you what, right now, I ain't going to do any of that Jewish stuff anymore. <laughs> Not kidding. Not kidding. Don't think you're going to convert me to like all this stuff that I've been delivered from. That's what he told me. I'm not kidding. Not kidding. A month later, he had his kippah, his talit, dusted off, back on. It's exactly how it happened. My wife, Rochelle. Are you kidding? She's a year into being a Robinson. Do you think in her wildest imagination that she was 
going to end up like this? No. No. <laughs> she got in the truck. You're right. <sighs> got in my pickup truck. Don't get any thoughts. I know that. That was lunch. Okay. Tom, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? So how'd you know it was here? Uh, through ministry. Okay. Right, William? You're back. I know you are. You're not getting out. <laughs> right? Yeah. Isn't that how you found a place? Just walking in the plaza? Yep. Talk to Larry? Yes. But here you are. Right. We all have testimonies. Testimonies. Right. I could tell you mine, but I'll keep you out of here. It'll take too long. <laughs> but I've seen God's providential hand open and shut doors. I've seen miracles. My life is about God's hand, a commitment to His will, a commitment to His word, trusting in His ways, and I see blessing upon blessing in my life that I never would have imagined in a billion years. But here I am. Isn't it reassuring? Isn't it reassuring to hear from others how powerful and wiser God is in directing our paths? Eliezer prayed for God's guidance and trusted him to be successful. How many of us today miss God's guidance and divine opportunities because we simply don't take the time to do what, Bob? To pray. Just to pray. Just to pray. Often we go through life just making decisions based on our own wisdom. And we do that often because we have the confidence that we're born again believers. <clears throat> and somehow that we have just sort of assimilated God's voice into our life. And everything we're going to choose to do is going to be right. You're born again spiritual believers. You've read the Bible. Ah, hey, we're born on you. But sometimes there are specific directions and instructions that you have to hear directly from the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you're not going to get those unless you take the time to silence yourself from all the distractions and focus on what the Lord has to say. It won't happen. Don't arrogantly think that you're always knowing the God Father's will unless you seek it. We need to recognize that we do not have the choice to direct our own paths or to make appropriate choices. We need to pray for God's direction in those matters and wisdom if we desire to receive His guidance. When I am in an unfamiliar city and get lost, I don't like some guys to guess. I ask someone who knows what direction to take after I've given up on the GPS. <laughs> and when I don't understand why my phone doesn't work right, I can spend hours trying to figure it out on my own, or I can call Michael Shalom and he can fix it for me. You and I don't know what decisions to make in life. But we can call upon the one who has the answers, brothers and sisters. We can have his divine direction in our life, but only when we take the time, set it aside, seek his wisdom. Not if any of you lacks wisdom, let them ask God who gives it to all generously. So the conclusion is very simple. I challenge you to remember these four essential principles when you choose to seek God's divine counsel. Because we all need it. We all need God's guidance for our lives. And we can receive it. You can receive it if you have knowledge of God's word, if you are committed to his will, if you trust in his ways, and you pray for his wisdom. That's simple. And I promise you, that you have the best possibility to make the right choice. And when you don't, guess what? It's not on the Lord, it's on you. But you know what? All things work together for good for those who seek His will, His purpose. So even when you don't even hear it right after that, He fixes it and turns it into good because He judges us by our hearts. He knows we tried to do it the right way. 
We read his word. We committed to his will. We trust in his ways. We sought his wisdom. He knows that. And when we still don't do it quite right, he'll make it right. Amen? He'll know God's voice for the rest of his life and to be able to affirm it like that. He knew in his spirit, he knew the, the words of God as they're spoken here amongst all of you. And he'll amen that. He'll know what to say no to and what to say amen to and affirm it. That's so important. Father, in Yeshua's name, four principles, your word is full of principles. But these are vital, Father, in our decision-making. We make decisions all the time. Our life is a reflection of choices we've made. People made choices today to be here or not be here. People made choices to listen to certain voices or to negate certain voices. We make decisions all the time. Are they the right ones? Sometimes, yes. Yes, and sometimes, no. Well, Father, our job is to love you with all our hearts, all our mind, and our brothers and sisters as we love ourselves. And Father, all that we can be responsible for is what we choose to do. And Father, I pray that we all, Father, in our decision making now, begin to own and affirm these principles for our life. That we'll do these things, Father, before we make any kind of decision. That our life is about commitment to your will and reading your word and trusting in your ways. Father, that we seek your wisdom as a young son should and young daughters, as 